everybody. It's a really great day here at the Pace Studio because I'm with Philippa Colthard. We're here to talk about Howard's End. I'm so glad it's back. It only took 20 years to do yeah. a good <laughs> revival of it. Um, tell me about your role as Helen. Uh, so I play Helen Schlegel, um, and she is the uh, younger sister, um, and she's very audacious and impulsive um, and, you know, uh, outspoken and idealistic, and uh, she sort of kicks off a lot of the drama, I'd say, um, by mistakenly uh, picking up someone's umbrella at a concert of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Um, and, uh, yeah, she's just sort of searching for meaningful connections and relationships in life and trying to find her way as a woman in Edwardian England. And, um, yeah. It's a very modern story, mm. I think. Um, I mean, I think it's still relatable because those women just kind of, Helen and Margaret just do what they want. Kind of, they're kind of trailblazers, I thought, independent spirits. Um, and I love that Helen does something impulsive and it kind of changes the course of everything. Mm. Um, tell me about, does that relate to you at all in real life? <laughs> uh, in like, some can, senses. Like, can you relate to something where, like, like, one thing happened and it felt like it changed everything? I mean, I often, like, think of myself as being, like, you know, far more cautious than Helen and certainly not as reckless or... Um, and that's certainly true in a lot of ways. But then sometimes I, f I do think I have done things that I think, oh, that was like a bit of a, a Helen move. Like, I mean, I moved to New York today. Uh, that so feels got, like a Helen move. Yeah. <laughs> and I've sort of done that a bunch of times. Like, you know, I just sort of picked up and um, moved to Los Angeles and then moved to London. And so I, I think I... Um, I'm curious about the world and, you know, uh, want to explore and that sort of thing. And um, I guess have realized that if I think too much about it or do too much planning, which I have a tendency to do, then I might rethink it um, and not do it. So, you know, with this New York move, I've tried to do minimal thinking about it. And um, yeah, so I got like three suitcases and we'll see how it goes. Oh my goodness. Everything's in three suitcases? That's the most astounding thing. <laughs> I thought I did a bad job. Like, you're supposed to move with... I mean, they're quite big. And, you know, how do you go up a, you know, a walk-up? Uh, well, that's three? true. You know, it's going to be very messy. That is true. <laughs> with three suitcases, I'm very impressed. I think everyone will be. <laughs> I think you did a good job. Oh, thank you. And I think that's really brave to just say I'm gonna move and not overthink it. Maybe people think too much. We need less yeah. thinking, everybody. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. And that's also not what Helen and Margaret would say no. at all. Um, because they actually do do a huge amount of thinking and I think yes. that's what separates them from the other characters in the story, particularly like the Wilcox family who I feel um, are, you know, they, they don't sort of agonize over um, you know, uh, uh, the, sh the Schlegels, that really yes. can... It does. Schlegels. Uh, so the Schlegels can really, you know, they sit around and will discuss politics and philosophy and literature and, you know, they want to look at everything from every angle and um, I think Helen and Margaret are always so aware of their, you know, try to really be aware of their privilege and that they have quite a narrow view of the world because of that and aim to widen that view. Um, whereas the Wilcoxes, I think, you know, they're less sentimental, they're more straightforward and, um, you know, they just sort of go out and they just get things done and, you know, it's it's not something that you should ponder about. And, um, uh, yeah, so Helen and Margaret are very much for thinking. Um, I think just in a few instances, um, Helen's heart sort of races ahead of her and, um, you know, that's when sort of a lot of the excitement in this story happens. Well, I think, too, though, the Wilcoxes, that they're kind of the haves. Mm. And maybe when you have a lot, which I am a very 
average American, I guess. But when you have a lot of things, you have more um, freedom to just, you know, talk about things and, and yeah. live like they do because they had more opportunity to. Yeah. And there's, they don't need a, a safety net. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> what I love about Helen and Margaret is that they they sort of acknowledge the the hypocrisy mm-hmm. in that, the idea that, you know, both of those extremes are a, a real form of privilege, like, you know, not having to sort of think about those things and ha- being blissfully ignorant is a real privilege, pri- pri- goodness me, <laughs> privilege. Um, and then as well for the Schlegel sisters, um, you know, the luxury to sit around and discuss politics and things, you know, that's very different to the third family in the story, which is the Basts, who really are not given, um, you know, uh, that luxury to really um, assess the world and question it is um, is not something that they have. It's more of a day-to-day struggle and... Um, life has is much more simplified and um, mm-hmm. yeah and immediate mm. you know yeah. thinking about what you're going to eat next what you're going to do next it's a little more yeah there's less room to sort of you know agonize about politics and philosophy and Mr. Bast you know is you know he's a bank clerk with like the heart of a poet and desperately wants to sort of mm-hmm. delve into all of that but um there's really not much room in his life for that. And in that, that's where I feel like it's very relatable to Mm. now, because I think, you know, that's something that's always been. Mm. And that's why the story holds up, I think, in a lot of ways, is because you can still really relate to all those different um, haves and have-nots. Yeah. Which is kind of what the story's about. Um, Let's talk about fashion. I came in a Howard's (laughs) End-inspired shirt today. You did. (laughs) You, of course, look very modern and summery, and I love it. I don't know why I'm summery. Well, it is really appropriate. Cold. Well, this sweater is holy. I don't think it's helping. <laughs> it's see-through. It's very it's not nice. not keeping me that warm. I really but I love the fashion in this. Would you want to wear clothes like that all the time? Was it a pain to get into them? With uh, the, the big skirt and the everything. I mean, I think, you know, of a lot of the sort of, um, it was certainly more, on the practical side than, say, like some of the 18th century dresses. But definitely the corset is not, um, you know, ideal. But I, um, you do, in a lot of ways, get used to it. And um, the director, Hetty, and, you know, the way Kenny Lonergan wrote the script, it was very much, wanted, you know, not wanting this to feel mannered or stiff um, because it can sort of lend itself to that, period drama acting and being stilted and formal which um, at the end of the day they're still people and they're still characters and that these clothes should feel like uh, clothes and not costumes Um, so yeah she was like no you need to get comfortable in that corset and you know if if I mean, Helen has quite bad posture in this miniseries. That's largely because I have quite bad posture. Um, <laughs> I'm, like, right actively now. thinking about this now, <laughs> and I'm too. still not even very... <laughs> yeah, I'm just so rubbish. And I, I... Anyway, and I was thinking, like, you're wearing a corset and you're finding a way to slouch in a corset. Um, but I also think that's quite Helen. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think the way that Haley and I tried to move in this... Um, in the miniseries was to... Tr- yeah, to try and feel, like, comfortable and um, and that we still would move, you know, like like the characters would, not be too sort of restricted. Um, but, yeah, I love the clothes, getting dressed every day. Like, it was the ultimate form of, of dress-ups, and especially for me, this being my first costume drama and having been... I've adored, you know, BBC period drama since I was very little and... Even, I don't think I even really understood what they were about. But, you know, I could tell that there were all of these people in these big dresses talking about things but not really saying what they felt. And, you know, there's so much going on underneath. And, um, you know, if you're a kid that loves acting, you know, you're always in the dress-up box. And this really is the ultimate form of dress-ups. So, yeah, I I had a ball. I loved it. (laughs) And I guess that if you were used to wearing a corset, 
like they were back then, you would feel comfortable and natural. Yeah, you would know how to move in it. You would know how to... Um, but, I mean, Hayley had has done, you know, several costume dramas and she was sort of giving me tips on, on how to make it work and I'm trying to think what what was one of the tips, like... Um, God, have I forgotten Haley's tips? Um, oh, about so sort of when they're doing up the corset, making sure you breathe out a bit, and so it's like um, so that it's a bit bigger, and so you can be like, hey, hey. oh, and, to trick them, yeah, to trick I them, like and it. so then you know, I like the idea of you're less them. like sort of squeezed in, but and we would keep them on from like the beginning of the day to the end of the day, so you're wearing them for a long time. Um, and, but you, you don't really notice them too much. It's only at the end of the day when you take it off and you're like, oh my goodness, that was really t- tight, yeah. Yeah, when you're so trim, you don't even need a corset. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? It's like, I don't know. I guess so, good for posture. Oh, yeah, good, good for posture. Oh, sure. <laughs> good lessons. Mm. Good lessons. Um, so you're originally from Australia, correct? Yes. What kind of drew you into acting? Did you always want to act? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I don't, my family is not, um, you know, in any way involved in, in show business. Like, my parents are very sciencey and, um, in, like, medicine and, um, so, but I think from about the age of 10, maybe even a bit earlier, I was just sort of hammering on about wanting to be an actress and, um, could not really be dissuaded Um, but I did realize they weren't really taking me seriously so then I for my Christmas and birthday present I was like I want an agent because I knew that that was one of the things you needed to be an actress was an agent and my parents you know were just you know my dad wears crocs and socks and um, (laughs) this this is not their world and uh they somehow, I think they must have Googled something that was in our in Brisbane, which is it's not r- a real hub for auditions by any means. Um, but they uh, found um, someone and I just sort of started doing auditions and, um, yeah, I just loved it and, you know, yeah. And kept going. Well, that's cool yeah. that they finally believed you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, they, once I sort of started going, they've always been... They've mm-hmm. always been very supportive, so that's good. And I just think I was just a pain, really, so they couldn't really ignore it. Well, I have kids in that age range, so I can understand. Are they? <laughs> do they seem in any way theatrically? Oh, I have. I have one that very much is, mm-hmm. and so he's been on some shoots with me. And then I have one that has no interest at all, just mm-hmm. totally fine. Because my yep. husband is not. He says like, "Don't take a picture of me." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is fine. He's a lawyer, and that's what they do. Yep. They're very private people. Yes. Does your dad still wear Crocs with socks? Yeah, he does. It's <laughs> uh, sort of a rotation, sometimes sandals and socks, mm. Crocs and socks. Um, yeah, you know? My my sister, like, hates hates the Crocs with a passion, but for Christmas she bought us all Crocs, everyone except for her. But... You know, it's quite annoying now because they are, you know, in my wardrobe at home. Right. And, like, if the dogs are barking in the garden, I need to go and get them or something, and the crocs are right there, and, you know. And you put them on. You put them on. She turned you into a croc wearer. (laughs) No, no, I don't want that. (laughs) Um, I know. I can see how you're dressed right now. I can tell it's not a croc. It's not a serious croc situation. Well. So are you the older or younger sister? I'm the oldest. Oh, so you got to pretend to be a younger sister. Yeah, which is nice. And I think, uh, you know, of the two of us, my, my sister is sort of more of the Helen, more of the, the wild child. So it was nice to play Helen. Yeah, I'm the older sister too, mm. the younger sister. Are you more of a, a Margaret? I am. Yep. I'm more of a type A Margaret. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing But wrong so you with that. got lots of experience watching your sister. Yeah. Be a wild child, maybe, or more of a free spirit. Yeah, I don't free know spirit. her. <laughs> yeah, certainly a free spirit and um, quite impulsive. Yeah, yeah. I think you're a little free too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think that is obvious. Um, what else do you plan to do when you're big move to New York City? I feel like I'm meeting you on a very um, momentous day. 
Like, yeah, I guess. You've moved here yeah. as of today. What are the big plans? Uh, I mean, don't tell people where you're moving, but like... <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I'm just excited to, you know, walk around in the city and just sort of when you get to know a place and, um, yeah, not, not I don't sort of have any, like, particularly touristy thing. If anything, I want to be not a tourist. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to um, sort of feeling familiar with places and, um, yeah, and it's just there's such an energy here and, you know, I've lived in London and, and I've lived in L.A. for a while before as well and so it's, yeah, I think it's just nice to get the feel of a city and, um, yeah, I'm excited for that. I agree. I think that when you move somewhere, I moved a lot mm. growing up um, and some in my adult life, but it's just nice to like really get to feel a town. And then when you yeah. move on, you still like really know it yeah. like a person kind of. Yeah. But it does kind of take on that, that role in your life where you're like, oh, I can, I know where that is. I feel comfortable here. Yeah. And, you know, know where your favorite food places are or mm -hmm. even the ones that you hate. And you can be like, oh, I remember that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited for that. I think, you know, I love moving to new places and sort of being out of my comfort zone in that sense. And, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Are your parents still in Australia? Yeah. Um, so they're all in, in Brisbane. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's so lovely to go home. And I usually try and go home for, like, because just going, you know, that huge flight, just going for anything less than a month I feel is sort of not really worth it. So I'll try and go for like a good chunk of time. And um, and yeah, I feel like my mum is always like, okay, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to the, oh, my mum hates it when I do her voice, but um, <laughs> you know, what, you want to go to the, the museum or, and um, I don't know, I feel like they almost want to show off Brisbane again to me, but you know, what's most exciting to me about coming home is just sort of staying at home spending all my time with the dogs and just sort of, yeah, existing at home and enjoying my mum's fully stocked pantry and, yeah, just being in Australia, going in the pool and the veranda. Yeah. Well, it sounds lovely. I've never been there. But, it is lovely. But now you've given your parents a place to come visit. That's yes. new. Yeah. Will they do that? I think they will. I mean, my mum definitely will. My dad is a bit of a workaholic. He's hard to extract oh. from Brisbane, but they will. Dads can they be that will. way. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, they'll definitely come and visit. I know my sister and brother will, so I'm sure I'm sure they'll come. They love, they've been to New York before and they okay. love it, so. Um, so the show is coming out, this mini-series event. What would you say is the part that would be most memorable for you? Oh, um... I mean, without giving any well, spoilers, which right. is... Right, well, it's Amazon. a movie and a book. It's a hundred-year-old <laughs> yeah. book, but... Um, well, don't spoil too much, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just think the, the relationship between the sisters is really special. Um, and uh, I, I guess every character goes on quite a journey, and that's what's so lovely about um, Forster's characters and... Um, and the way Kenny's captured them is that, you know, uh, every character feels very fully formed and flawed and um, nuanced and, um, yeah, so I think um, just enjoying a closer look at these characters because, you know, the miniseries does give the luxury of uh, four hours to sort of go in depth and... Um, yeah, that was, you know, very vague, but... <laughs> That's... Vague is fine. I would say a miniseries is always better for... A, I shouldn't say always. I think it's almost always better for a book because there's so much depth to a character. Mm. And, like, if you really love a book and then it's a two-hour movie, there's just so much that gets lost when you watch yeah. it. Not that the movie is great, but obviously, one of words, but... Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love it. But I really love this miniseries because it does go into a little more into the relationships, a little more into the feeling that I think was the original intent of the book, which I yeah. really enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the two very different takes on the stories, yeah. and I mean, they have to be because, um, 
you know, the Merchant Ivory has, a, you know, a really limited amount of time, and so it's such an amazing concentrated sort of hit of the story. And um, yeah, but no, I, I think that's definitely true that you get a lot more of that detail and get to sort of inhabit that world a little bit more. Yeah, and you don't feel like you got. I don't want to say cheetah, but you don't feel like you don't feel like you missed anything. Like you don't sit down at the end and go, "Oh, I really skipped this really great part of the book," because you know they only had two hours. Mm -mm. But you feel like, yeah, you feel like you get the whole experience. So I think people are gonna love it. I really loved it. It's beautiful. Oh, and you were God. great in it. Oh, thank you. So, but thank you so much for talking to me today. Really lovely to talk it's been to you. Great, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you.